My name is Alexi, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Florian Lagner, who joins us live from San Diego, California, home of the D3D Tokamak. Florian is an experimental physicist from the Technical University of Vienna and a former professional handball player. During his PhD, he worked on the Aztec's Upgrade Tokamak, one of the flagship devices of the European Fusion Program. He joined the Princeton Plasma Control Group as a postdoc, and in 2019, he became a full-on research scientist at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. Florian's main research focus is the plasma edge region, especially edge localized mode instabilities. He's working on the LAMA diagnostic, which measures the neutral density of hydrogen at the edge of D3D. Taking LAMA as an example, Florian will outline the path from, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to measure this quantity to the deployment of a robust diagnostic on a research fusion reactor? Without further delay, I will now mute myself and hand over to him. Welcome and enjoy the talk. Yeah, so welcome from my side. Good morning from San Diego or to wherever you are joining from. Thanks, Alexi, for the really nice uh, introduction, for giving me the opportunity to present this virtual meeting. I think in a time where we keep uh, socially distanced, I really appreciate such innovative meetings uh, as the Fusion EP talk series that bring the Fusion community um, closer together, especially students. So today's topic is diagnosing fusion rate plasmas. And there are just too many quantities to be measured and even more ways to measure them. Therefore, it's not the goal of the following talk to summarize all of them. i rather go through um, a working example, LAMA diagnostic, which stands for the Lyman Alpha Measurement Apparatus, a diagnostic that enables neutral density measurement in D3D. And I have been lucky to contribute to the development of this over the past one and a half years. So starting first, why is it important to actually build plasma diagnostics? The human senses are not well suited to perceive the conditions in fusion plasma. We can only see parts of the visual spectrum and we do not feel temperatures orders of magnitude higher than the body temperature. Plasma diagnostics really enable us and to determine our understanding of fusion plasmas. What we cannot measure remains hidden. A very nice historical example is the application of Thomson scattering in 1969. This enabled to measure the better energy confinement in Tokamax and shifted actually the research focus to this confinement con concept. And Thomson scattering still remains one of the key diagnostics uh, in a fusion device. Diagnosing a fusion plasma is not as easy as sticking just a thermometer inside a device. Because in general, uh, fusion plasmas are rather sensitive to external influences. Therefore, one main criterion is that plasma diagnostics are non-invasive, meaning that the measurement does not perturb the actual plasma itself. Over the years, various of these techniques were developed, probing different quantities of fusion plasma. And this led to a zoo of diagnostics. Exemplarily shown is an image of the output ball of the D3D tokamak, indicating all the installed diagnostics. The development of these techniques is typically driven by advances in technology outside of the field of fusion science. So lasers, optical sensors, or microwave techniques have enabled diagnostics that seem surely impossible decades ago. In general, one can distinguish between active and passive measurements. So active means the plasma is probed by the interaction with an external type actuator. Passive diagnostics directly measure information originating from the plasma itself. Going through all of these techniques fills textbooks. So I will now focus on Lyman alpha measurements which are passive. However, I will try to point out the universal challenges that any measurement idea will have to change before being actually deployed 
in a, on a fusion machine. So in a nutshell, the five steps required to create a plasma diagnostic discussed on the working example of LAM, the Lyman Alpha Measurement Apparatus. First, everything needs a motivation and a goal. So the initial step is to figure out why it is necessary to, to measure a certain quantity and if knowledge of this quantity leads to a better understanding of the fusion plasma itself. Second, most important um, is to find a way to measure actually the desired quantities. Multiple ways might lead to the same goal, but some of them might be easier than others or even less resource intensive. Here it can be decided with a lab scale proof of principle testing is required or the harsh fusion environment and with high magnetic fields, neutron bombardment or heat flow loads uh, can be considered. Third, a conceptual design uh, tries to integrate the measurement into a fusion experiment. Here iteration steps are usually needed and sometimes we need to take a step back and evaluate if the measurement approach is adequate for being integrated into a fusion environment. Fourth is once a design um, emerges and gets finalized, you can actually go forward and build the setup. And fifth, the demonstration of showing that all of this work led to a work about led to a working diagnostic has to be done. So jumping right into it, why measuring neutrals in P3D? So as briefly mentioned, the idea is to measure the particle source inside P3D. And this is important because um, this determines how much plasma is created. Very sophisticated diagnostics have been developed to actually measure the plasma. However, to fully understand its behavior on the edge of a tokenmark, you must study its source. So these are the neutral particles entering the plasma. And for fusion plasma, these are hydrogen or deuterium atoms. What you actually see when looking at the plasma shot in D3D, as indicated on the right, is the interaction of the plasma with the neutrals. So it seems obvious to use the information of this radiation to infer the neutral particle density. And this has been done for a while using different approaches, mainly the microscopy in the visible part of the hydrogen light, like using cameras or so-called photoscopes. Sorry. So, LAMA has to be designed to measure the brightness of the neutral emission at two locations, the inboard, eichel side, and the outboard hybrid side of P3D. It focuses on a region around the separatrix, which is the transition region between confined plasma um, and surfaces and the so-called scrape off layer here on the outside. Here, the neutral particles actually can enter the confined plasma region and being ionized and then providing plasma uh, fueling. So let's get to the diagnostic approach. How can we measure neutral density? Uh, in which specific challenges arise with this approach? When looking at the plasma shot, in P3D, uh, what is actually observed is the interaction of the plasma with the neutrons, the radiation. To infer the neutral particle densities, we can solve a rate equation system that basically determines uh, the density of the neutral. Um, so if you look at the hydrogen atom, you have various lines uh, being present, and these come from distinct transitions. So we have the Balmer series in the visible 
but there are also the Lyman series um, or the Paschen series. Most important, uh, the density of the neutral particles is related to the brightness of these individual lines. So why choosing Lyman alpha? Well, it is a very bright line. So it has, uh, it, it's an easy, relatively easy signal to detect. The reflectivity in, the, uh, in this wavelength range, which is in the vacuum ultraviolet, on any wall material is low. So the line integrated measurement is a truly line integrated measurement and no um, reflections uh, can cause uh, spurious signals. And the molecular background sitting below this line is uh, definitely smaller than, for example, in the visible range for the bar line. But the challenge arising with this is that hydrogen is not the only element that is being present in these regions. So there is carbon coming off from the walls because the tires are out of carbon composites. And this creates some radiation as seen in the spectrum on the right. Especially there's a carbon free line very close to the Lyman alpha line. And we have to get rid of this component if we are doing, um, uh, if we really want to just measure the hydrogen contribution in the spectrum. So for diagnostics that work with this, diagnosticians that work with visible light, this line uh, may seem pretty far apart and very well distinguishable, but in this wavelength range, typically filter bandwidths are larger than 10 nanometer. So this would be just um, detected at once. One approach to actually suppress this carbon would be to deploy a Bragg mirror that selectively measures Lyman alpha. And we can get a factor of 2.5 knockdown in the carbon, which is not good enough. So um, using the filter does even better. We get a factor of 4.4 uh, between the Lyman alpha line and the carbon line. So the combination of a mirror and the filter would even further knock down the carbon. However, this um, pushes down the overall detect signal as well. So in order to get to this, sorry, in order to get to this, we just zoom a bit in and get a nice vector of 11 knocks down from the Lyman alpha to the carbon and put constraints on other parts of the signal, like um, creating of the signal processing, like requiring uh, higher gain amplifiers to actually uh, amplify the final measurement. Uh, so LAMA deploys a, a simple imaging concept, which is a pinhole camera. The Bragg mirror and the interference filter were already discussed. We're deploying AXD photo detectors in an array in order to convert the incoming photon flux uh, into, an, uh, in, into uh, a current. This is then uh, amplified by a trans impedance amplifier and converted into a voltage, which is digitized and made available uh, to the user. Uh, what is of general importance here is that the knowledge of all the processes that generate, transmit, and convert the desired information is in, is uh, is yeah is very important. Uh, for example, the local transmission of Lyman alpha through the plasma um, combines multiple plasma pro properties and needs to be unfolded by solving a rate equation system. Uh, for the transmission of the signal, the quality of this can suffer by degradation that can evolve over time. So it's important to 
be aware of, of these uh, external influences occurring on long time scale. And of course, the sensitivity of the conversion in the individual steps of the information can be also changing. In the end, having as much information in hand over all the system components allows to model the system behavior and ensuring that the intended purpose is fulfilled by the final product. If there are uncertainties in any of these components, it might be useful to provide or to create small lab scale test setups that help to mitigate risks on the performance and individual components early on. So, wrong direction. So, with this and reasonable understanding, one moves to a conceptual design stage. Uh, and here, integrating the diagnostic into the fusion environment is a major challenge. Fusion machines are typically not designed around diagnostic approaches, and there are all sorts of trade-offs and considerations to be made. In case of the LAMA, specific challenges arose from targeting the Lyman on alkaline. Vacuum ultraviolet radiation is absorbed under atmospheric conditions. So we have to put the detectors inside the primary vacuum of the E3D. And this then leads to a full list other engineering constraints uh, that need to be incorporated, like extending bakes up to 400 centigrade or only using qualified materials. In the end, this, the output of this process was a nice CAD model. And here you see the main components of the diagnostic, the head of the lava, if you will. It consists of two pinhole camera systems and, and all of these components beside the electronics are placed inside the primary vacuum left to this vacuum flange in the bed. We can now remove the outer shielding shown in transparent gray. We can have a glint at the, in, at the, at the final alignment and design of these components. So looking um, at a view coming from the pinhole, we first have a pneumatic actuated shutter that protects the diagnostic from glow discharges and bakes. The black mirror is held in a custom mirror mount and reflects the radiation towards the detector box, which has an interference filter and um, the AXUB detector which has um, a pretty good quantum efficiency in the VUV way. One can see also an embedded cooling water loop at the bottom here that protects the diagnostic components during the high temperature bakes. So with the design maturing at this point, it's actually time to build LAMA. So, this is LAMA with, with outer tube uh, removed. And typically, implementations may differ from the CAD model, but you see all the components more or less um, being exactly the same as indicated in the CAD model. So um, on top, you see a quarter dollar to just give you an illustration on the scale of this implementation. It is a relative compact design and this allows to remove the llama head from the VCD vacuum vessel and it can be transferred to a laboratory uh, vacuum stand where it is routinely calibrated during the 3D um, events. A lot of um, novel measurement techniques and cutting edge technology went into the fabrication of this design that is so complex. So, for example, we used 3D printed inconel for the base plate with the embedded cooling loops and non magnetic three axis mirror mounts that uh, have a custom uh, design to withstand like the forces in 
that fusion machine. And uh, all the components were measured with a so-called coordinate measuring TMM uh, arm that determined the position relative to the vacuum flange. And with these accurate measurements, it's a, it's a, it's, it allows to reconstruct the lines of sight uh, inside the D3D vessel. So by just simply knowing the uh, location of all the components and with respect to the flange and the position of the flange with respect to the D3D, one can accurately determine the lines of sight. So to perform an absolute calibration, uh, we have created this calibration stand here on the right. Uh, it consists out of a lime and alpha source, a manipulator to remove the lime and alpha source with respect to the llama, and a custom adapter that actually recreates the lines of sight as inside D3D. With a VUV spectrometer, we can characterize the source and we have an absolutely calibrated photodiode that allows to calibrate the source. What we get out of here of this is shown on the left. The calibration factor that converts our measured volts into a detected Lyman alpha brightness. And luckily, the calculated nominal calibration factors and the actual measured calibration factors uh, agree very well. With this, Lama is ready to be installed in D3D. So the Lama here is shown after installation on the left in the port of D3D. It actually looks quite simple since all the components are covered by the enclosure tube. And the lines of sight geometry are here shown on the right hand side. So we have two views monitoring the inboard high field side the output low field side with 20 channels each. And you see the tangency radii of all of each of these views here indicated in magenta. These tangency radius sample roughly 20 centimeters around the separatrix, so here in the colloidal cross section, and the average spot size of these measurement locations at the tangency radius is about 25 millimeters. With this, Lama is ready to open its eye, also known as the shutter, and finally demonstrate that all the above discussed steps uh, lead to the goal. So what I'm presenting here are initial Lama measurements of a single channel inside D3D yeah, in black. And these are compared to the more commonly measured Balma alpha intensity in red. And what we see is various transient events that are known to affect the hydrogen emission. And all of them can be resolved in Lama. So this is a transition from low to high confinement mode, which typically results in a drop of hydrogen emission. And this is resolved with Lama as well as with Balma. And the atoms also appear in the lava signal, as well as uh, hydrogen pellets that were injected to the plasma. So this is all, and all very promising that lama actually measures um, hydrogen radiation. Furthermore, first lama alpha um, brightness profiles were measured on the inboard and on the outboard side of D3D. And um, what we performed here on top was a measurement where we increased the neutral gas um, and injection into the D3D vessel. And as expected, with increasing neutral gas, the overall brightness of Lyman alpha increases. Furthermore, the plasma, the profile shade of these measurements remain um, the same when we shift the plasma. So here, the plasma shifted rigidly in space. Uh, these dashed lines indicate the location of the separatrix. 
and once you map it to a coordinate system with respect uh, to the separatrix, we actually see that the shape is very well conserved. So uh, with this, um, it's really demonstrating that you are measuring the interaction of the plasma with the neutral. And in summary, this um, indicates and demonstrates that the diagnostic stage is actually measuring, uh, actually fulfilling its purpose. So with this, I want to uh, summarize. Diagnosis of fusion grade plasmas only takes five steps, but each of these steps comes with challenges uh, that require careful thinking. And if you ever have to go through the process of designing a plasma a diagnostic, remember to think why, how, and which components understand and plan what you want to do and then build it. And of course, finally enjoy the demonstration that it's actually working. With respect to LAMA, which is the live and alpha measurement apparatus, and we um, design a pinhole camera system that uh, uses Bragg mirror and uh, interference filter to suppress uh, parasitic carbon line contributions. And um, we also were able to absolutely calibrate this measurement. And uh, finally took first proof of principle measurements inside D3D. And there are many more to come. As a final remark, I would like to highlight the Fusion Research is a multinational, multi institutional team effort. And same being true for the LAMA herd. We, the LAMA team, are working for different institutions like Theresa Wilkes, Aaron Rosendahl, and Jerry Hughes are with MIT PSFC, and Alessandro Bortolone and myself are with PPPL. We are stationed at different locations in the United States and implemented LAMA and D3D in National Fusion Facility. A great team is standing aside closely, and this provides the basis for success. Even present day times may no, not permit to do this right now physically, but our scientific and personal exchange and progress continues or even grows. I think with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that came up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian. What a very, very instructive talk. Uh, made me smile several times, beautiful graphics. Uh, I love the background. <laughs> and uh, now let's uh, move on to the Q&A. Yes, hello, hello from, from Madrid. And thank you for a very interesting and very clear uh, talk. Um, so I have more a personal question for you than the sure. uh, topic. Uh, so if I understand correctly, you study in Vienna and you work yes. in Germany. Yes. And now you are in Princeton in the United States, right? I'm employed in Princeton. I'm actually located in San Diego. California. So this is just like West Coast versus East Coast. Yes. Okay. I'm a student of the European Master of uh, Fusion Energy and Engineering Physics. And maybe I'm also interested in doing a PhD in the United States. So I wanted to ask you <laughs> how was this process for you uh, coming from Europe? Um, it was a very exciting time I would guess. So so I have to say I did grad school in Europe and uh, grad school in the United States is a bit different because um, in Europe you have master's programs and then you join typically grad school for three years or three plus years versus in the US uh, the master's program is embedded into grad school so you have a 
about two years of classes and then moving on to a three-year thesis project. So I would say the experience of grad school in the US is probably a different one, um, but there are various programs uh, available and these are all well known. And, and I think uh, Fusion EP can point you to them. In, in general, I would say for me coming to the US was definitely uh, a great experience in the sense that I met many more new people. I learned uh, different, a different kind of different approach in doing science where like motivating and arguing for research is a very important uh, topic and to um, appropriately present results. Um, the, the, the focus of the US program really um, seems to target um, innovative solutions. So new ideas are very welcome, uh, branching off the main lines of research. And uh, yeah, I would say it, it, it evolves very rapidly. And I, like three years ago when I came to the US, I would not imagine to end up at this position where I'm currently at. So I cannot even tell you where I'm going to be in three years. So this is like <laughs> a very fast dynamic environment here. I see. And when it comes to the preparation, did you have to do a preparatory course or something to join the PhD um, there or? So for the PhD, you have to apply to grad school. So this is not like you, in, in Europe, it's more you find a supervisor and that takes you on. Uh, mm -hmm. In the US, it's more formalized. So you read, there's an application deadline and you're typically associated with this is like a ton of documents you need to submit. And sometimes you have to do uh, what's called the generals. So this is a, a oh, sorry, no, it's not the generals but you have to do a, a certain type of test, a standardized test that basically yes. ranks you. Um, plus there are fees and, and stuff that have to be considered. I, I know from uh, a bunch of uh, students from Europe, actually out of the, the um, master's program in uh, the Netherlands, that they joined uh, grad school in the US and I, I would be happy to connect with, uh, with them. So then you can have like the more grad student experience. So if you just um, send me an email or, or chat me, I can chat, I can put my email in the chat to you. Then okay. uh, we can get yeah. the con That would be very helpful. helpful. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Florian, for the for the for the help. Indeed, we would like to promote such conversations uh, through our platform so that uh, there is science that's discussed, obviously, but also that there is. Uh, in general information that has uh, that is uh, distributed so thanks a lot yeah that's my um, job. so as we see we have been surprised by zoom and we apparently have no access to the raise hand option yeah, yeah. yes fabio, fabio fabio has a question yes yes um you can yeah yeah there you go fabio yeah uh very nice talk on the development of the diagnostic itself. Uh, so I'm not sure if I got that right. So uh, you mentioned that you choose Lyman Alpha because it is like you, you see light only, like the Lyman Alpha light is produced mainly from uh, uh, hydrogen excitation and not from molecules. Is that what you, what you, what you said in the talk? So yes, so sorry that this was a bit unclear. Um, so the Lyman alpha is a, is a distinct hydrogen transition. And what you can have around Lyman alpha, a molecular, what's called molecular contribution. And this is if you have a hydrogen 
molecule with two atoms, you have all sorts of vibrational or rotational um, excitations. And these can create like a continuum radiation or more or less these are distinct peaks, but they are so, so tight that you get like a continuous background. And that of course contaminates uh, the Lyman alpha signal. And then I think the main advantage is, for example, if you have a metal ball tokamak, tungsten tokamak, it looks like a mirror. And that means that visible light is reflected all the way around. So what your measurement then is, is like you're looking at a certain tile and actually the light comes from another place and it's just reflected by the tile. The advantage of Lyman alpha is that the reflectivity uh, in this wavelength range of any kind of material is substantially lower than for any other hydrogen line. So with Lyman alpha, you can be sure that you're actually just measuring from the pinhole to wherever um, the wall is located. This is important to actually then invert the brightness profile uh, to an emissivity. I see. Uh, what, one other thing that one other doubt that I have is because I'm I'm doing myself spectroscopy in the Balmers of the Balmer series. Yes. And, uh, the, the the low excited states, you know, because I look at uh, at the linear machine with higher pressure, the lower yeah. excited states are heavily heavily uh, influenced by any hydrogen molecule being around there. So you don't. So like in, it is it is hard to me at least to separate uh, mm -hmm. if I have only one line emission like you know line nine like like two to one yeah to separate right. uh, excitation and other mechanisms and so it's hard for me to say you know is it really the high density of hydrogen or just mm -hmm. a bunch of molecules that are charging the line like crazy yeah yeah we are we are like if, with the llama we cannot distinguish between like um like molecule we don't have the spectral information so we really cannot say a lot about like molecular fractions and um, other stuff of course you can look into vuv spectroscopy uh, but that's a totally different beast <laughs> like, so you, you 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 just assume that there are no molecules in, in order to get no thing. no we we treat molecules and uh, hydrogen atoms like atomic and molecular like the same so in the end yes we, we assume in the collisional radiative mode we are not um, assuming any dissociation processes or like uh, recombination processes at this point okay cool gotcha yeah but you have probably low pressure so it's fine yeah no it's uh, oh yeah i mean i should should mention that like the, the, the particle neutral particle densities are 10 to the 16 per cubic meter typically in this area Okay, cool. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Fabio, for the question. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Amro. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. But the question is uh, about uh, asking you, Florian, if you are presently involved in diagnostic projects for ITER with PPPL. Um, the, they joined the talk late, so maybe they missed already said and yeah. also they want to know if you could describe briefly such uh, diagnostics for eater purpose uh, like eater purpose type what are the kind of diagnostics ha you have come across uh, at the PPPL where they are doing such work okay um, so I have not personally been working on eater diagnostics so I think this is a very exciting uh, topic and yes pppl just recently got um, more funding to do and to continue ether diagnostic developments i think there are um i'm trying to pull up the list at this point but i think there are a couple of main uh, diagnostics where pppl is contributing to it's um one i can I definitely know is the low field side uh, reflectometer. So this is a microwave based diagnostic that uses a sort of radar technique to measure the density of the plasma. Then there is also uh, 
toroidal interferometer, uh, which PPPL is working on. So that measures basically the line integrated uh, density in toroidal direction with a very high time resolution. This is a laser based diagnostic. There is the electron cyclotron emission diagnostic for ETA where PPPL is contributing to. Um, this is a passive diagnostic that collects uh, microwaves originating from the plasma and allows to measure the electron temperature. And then uh, there are, I think, two or three other uh, diagnostics. Uh, PVPL is currently um, leading or collaborating on the design. And of course, building a diagnostic for ITER uh, is multiplying the effort that it takes to build a diagnostic for these for me because everything has to be um, done within very stringent protocols to ensure that the diagnostic uh, will actually survive uh, fusion power operations. So the amount of neutrons that will is going to hit um, these diagnostics is orders of magnitude higher than what we have in DCD. The heat load that goes on to specific components of these diagnostics is um, uh, unprecedented, unprecedented at this time. It's, it's just huge and it requires active cooling and then of course the plasma itself is so harsh that you get coatings on mirrors antennas and stuff and all of these things need to be considered early on they have to be signed off by the ether organization and this is really a multi-step multi-year process to finally get a measurement into ether and this is all done to just ensure that this last point the demonstration that the diagnostic is working um, will actually um, yeah, be fulfilled. Thanks a lot. Follow up uh, on this. Sorry, uh, were you continuing, Florian? No, I was, I'm done. I was just um, asking if there is like a follow-up question that I uh, can try to be more specific. Yeah, that was, I was uh, about to ask Amro uh, again. Uh, yeah. Did you get the answer of the question that you were looking for, if you could let us know in the chat or uh, in personal chat. And in the meanwhile, I would like to request you all to take a few minutes from your schedule and provide us a feedback on today's talk. Uh, there is a link in the chat. Please, we'll be very grateful if you could uh, let us know how we can improve this interface so that uh, we can encourage more interaction. And in the meanwhile, uh, while I waste for, yeah, so I got the answer. That was the question from Amro. So thanks a lot, Florian. We have another question from Daniel Refi. Uh, and uh, this will be the last question of the, of the session. So go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, hi. hi hey there. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> team. yeah, so uh, I have the privilege to know Florian from ASDEX. So I work in pretty team in that. So I have some technical questions regarding the interference filter design. So uh, because you use the filter to to suppress background and carbon, yeah, carbon lines. So because the signal to background ratio might be affecting the measurement badly because right. it can change also. So what were the considerations for for so why why did you go for ten nanometer filter? This is very wide. There are much much narrower filters, so because there is no, no so, top layer. And sorry, I missed the first ten minutes of the talk, so maybe. Okay. Uh, uh, that's, I'm, so, I'm very so, sorry. So, so in the no 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 worries no worries in the, in the VOV the filter bandwidths are typically around ten nanometers. Oh. Like if or if you know a V let let, let me put it another way <laughs> if you know a VOV filter that has one nanometer bandwidth, I would be very glad mm. to hear. Yeah, okay. um, so, so that's the main challenge there. Um, what we do in order to um, compare a signal to background is actually we have VUV spectrometers, just single lines of sight that can mm -hmm. determine like a carbon background. And there are plans to use this to, to qualify um, the actual um, the, the actual ratio of 
carbon line to uh, lime and alpha line in the fusion plasma in case that there are very high carbon concentrations. So far, what we have seen that even if you have like UFOs, so carbon chunks coming off the wall, uh, we do not see a big increase mm -hmm. in our signal. So that makes us confident that the dominant contribution to the signal um, is still lime and alpha and the carbon is only like a minor fraction so that the signal to background is actually uh, relatively high uh, for for any kind of carbon concentrations mm. but it's true that this will change so yeah okay and uh, what is the quantum efficiency of this vuv uh, uh, it's a of... it's roughly one at Lyman Alpha, and it's really tough oh. to find something uh, better. But it's also known that these uh, AXUV diodes degrade uh, over time and with um, power hitting the surface. So we will see. So far, we haven't noticed any degradation from uh, like exposure of the long time exposure of the detectors. Uh, but there is. Um, there is yeah the potential there so that's also nice about the llama that you just remove it and actually we have two heads so if something breaks you can just swap them and continue measuring okay thank you for yeah and so thanks Dan, yeah. this was very nice thank you bye yeah thanks for joining it's good to see old friends thanks a lot everyone for joining and Thank you very much, Florian, for the wonderful insight into the LAMA aspect uh, diagnostics. Uh, we hope to see you around.